Bill Curry is a political columnist for Salon and many other publications. Mr. Curry was a White House counselor to President Clinton and a two-time Democratic nominee for governor of Connecticut. He is at work on a book on President Obama and the politics of populism. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Bill Curry. Great to be with you. Thank you. Bill Curry, let's get to the nub of the problem. This is the worst Republican Party, arguably, in history. I think Senator Robert Taft, Mr. Conservative in the 1950s, would have been appalled. Dwight Eisenhower, president, would have been appalled. Teddy Roosevelt wouldn't have recognized the party. This is a party that openly wants to toxify the environment more by dropping law and order regulations. They're against labor, workers, low-income people. They have anti-children proposals. They want to cut everything dealing with the necessities of the American people and give big tax breaks and other immunities and privileges to corporations and take the federal cop off the corporate crime beat. They're militaristic in foreign policy. It's never enough for the military budget in the Pentagon, even exceeding what the generals want. So why can't the Democratic Party defeat and landslide in recent decades, the Republican Party, and instead, it's losing out to the Republican Party, most recently two open seats for the House of Representatives in Kansas and Montana. Okay, it's an answer that's so long, I'm only going to give you a little bit of it. You know, there are technical issues and structural issues and strategic issues that people debate in the media all the time. The Democratic Party very famously under the uh, aegis of Rahm Emanuel when he was at the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, pursued a, a policy of hyper-targeting races, only spending money in the most competitive races, and uh, also of tailoring every message to each district, trying to find candidates who they thought matched the district, but mostly doing so by avoiding big national issues. It was a part of the party losing its identity. People remember that between Rahm Emanuel and Howard Dean, who took over as a national chair after 2004, there was a great debate over whether to have a 50-state strategy to bring the party to every community or to continue to do it as Rahm did it. And so they can fix all those things. All those things need to be – they need a 50-state strategy. They need to be in every precinct in America. The first thing to, to, to note about the Democrats is that still in thrall to the Rahm Emanuel approach, they ignored the Kansas race, which the Republican eventually won with only 52% of the vote, the Democrat having been abandoned by his national party in their very first post-Trump race. They've done very poorly all the way back to Emanuel, including now in terms of candidate recruitment, in terms of the quality of the candidates. But most importantly, I just want to say that the center of this is what Democrats call message, but which is really policy. And in their search for the perfect message, Democrats ignore policy, even progressive Democrats to some significant degree. Spell that out. Spell that out. Well, it works on a lot of levels. First of all, the Democratic Party has colonized much of the institutional left, the labor movement, most of the Washington-based environmental and various other social change movements. You know, in the old days, in the last glory days of progressivism in America in the late 1960s, the great environmental movement, the consumer movement, as you well know, the civil rights, peace, women's movements, were all independent grassroots movements. And then in the beginning of the 1980s, they all formed PACs. They all got into electoral politics. They were all intimidated by the Reagan ascendancy. And in the coming years, they basically traded the politics of pressure for the politics of access, which works very well for the progressive uh, movement leaders, but not very well at all for the progressive movements or the issues which they champion. And slowly, what has happened over time is, as the Democratic Party has, in effect, colonized the left, it has become the first progressive movement, which for a whole generation has no bottom line. There are no deal breakers. You mean uh, like uh, if if you don't support universal health insurance? But in in the 1980s, I was honored to be the political director of the nuclear freeze movement. And we had a very simple equation. We were for not world peace, but a very specific blueprint, a mutual 
verifiable freeze on the research, development, production, and deployment of nuclear weapons. All with the them. Soviet Union. And it had to be bilateral. That's right. It had to be bi- excuse me. It had to be bilateral, verifiable, and it had to extend to all phases of development and deployment. And if you were for it, we were for you, regardless of party. And if you weren't for it, we weren't for you, regardless of party. And that's how all progressive movements at that time worked. And it was better for them and the Democrats because it's been the role of progressive movements to give the Democratic Party its spine and its vision. The Democratic Party has been the vessel through which the progressive movements from the agrarian populists to the progressives of the turn of the century to the New Deal up into the Great Society and the 60s social change movements Those were the great engines of social progress in America. Those were the architects of our prosperity and of a society which is more just and more inclusive. So when did the the, 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 They made the Democratic Party better by by keeping it at arm's length, by not becoming so close to it. They actually helped it more. What's the nature of the rot? What's the nature of the rot here? Is it money from Wall Street? Is it that our side doesn't put down conditions the way you did for the nuclear freeze movement? The AFL-CIO endorses the Democratic candidates with no conditions about living wage or full health insurance. Where is the rot coming from that has basically given this party the ultimatum power to the American people where else do you have to go? You've got to vote for us. The Republicans are worse. Where did the well, rock say, come from? Let me say, first of all, it comes from money. But before I talk about that, I just want to say that, you know, what's happened here is that the leaders of these progressive movements, these Washington-based progressive movements that were once independent movements and are now just Washington lobbies with grassroots mailing lists, the leaders of these movements are like just so much adjunct faculty to the Democratic Party. And their relationship, they see their career paths through the party. Their most fundamental alliances are with the party. And again, as I said, that's hurt everyone. It's not that they've all been corrupted by money. The party's been corrupted by money. And it has adopted a set of views that are convenient to its corruption. One of which is that it believes not in winning elections by developing bold policy blueprints, but in winning elections by clever messaging by micro-targeting. When I was with the Freeze and, and, and you with the consumer movement, no great progressive movement in American history ever had a separate message for every state or every demographic. There was no narrow casting. It is the, it in the very essence of progressive social change that you put a big, broad idea on the table. And if you believe in the idea and if it's a credible idea that speaks to a problem people care about, it will do your organizing and your fundraising for you. We stopped believing in the power of ideas and we forgot that policy precedes message, that you first have to figure out what you believe and then how to tell people about it. And so the progressives became like the Democrats, using the same consultants and peddling the same ads and pursuing the same strategies. By the way, on the other side, the Republicans, at least the Republicans, I'll say this for them, they invested in think tanks. When we were investing in celebrity pollsters and consultants, the Republicans were building Cato, Heritage, Hoover, American Enterprise. They sank a fortune into policy development, bad policy development, but policy development. And while the Democrats were sinking all of their fortune, the smaller fortune, into their cult consultants and pollsters, who, by the way, actually made most of their living as corporate pollsters and consultants, doing the Democratic candidates on the side, which was itself, would itself in any other profession be a conflict of interest. And the result has been a a national political debate that's like a fight to the death between Ayn Rand and Marshall McLuhan. (laughs) The Republicans are actually running an analysis, and we're running... You know, the medium is the message. Okay, I know our, it, list, our listeners are now thinking, okay, Bill Curry, what about the Bernie Sanders movement? What about third parties to hold the Democratic Party's feet to the fire? Can you run through those quickly? Yeah, I'll just say this. I don't believe that we've done this right. I think the left has been too quick to simply engage in protest parties every two or four years, protest candidacies. I really believe that it demonstrates in part uh, an American reluctance to vie for power in politics. 
And I really do believe that the lesson for us is clear from what the Tea Party did. The second major party, now the first party in America, the Republican Party, is a proto-fascist party. In six short years, beginning in 2009, it was taken over by a loose conglomeration of groups uh, we call the Tea Party. They've taken everything, the House, the Senate, the Supreme Court, the White House, most legislatures, most governors, while the Democratic Party has reached the absolute nadir, become just a shadow of what it once was. And I believe we have to look at that strategy, not emulate their tone, not match their extremism, but we have to go after the Democratic Party from the inside. We have to fight it. People talk about whether it will reform or not, and I think that confuses progressives. The question isn't whether the present leadership of the Democratic Party will ever be reformed. It won't be. The question is whether it can be replaced, and if so, how? And as I've said before in this show, nothing gets the herd's attention like a good culling. If progressives were to concentrate on primaries against some of the worst Democrats, most tied to Wall Street, who are the worst obstructionists, even winning a few of those would change how all of them thought. What about Bernie Sanders' movement? And well, I think, the, I think the Sanders movement, let me just say, there's a lot of problems that I see in terms of how they're doing. I mean, Bernie's doing well in getting out there and, and representing his, his views. In 2009, Barack Obama had built the largest grassroots electoral political movement in American history. And the first thing he did when he got in office was to take it private to put it under the control of his donors and a couple of technicians, and actually, quite literally, it was housed in the DNC. And DNC, Democratic the, National The Democratic Committee. National Committee, which effectively just shook the life right out of it. It, it died of neglect. And, now, uh, Bernie, it, it, Bernie, let's go to Bernie. And That's Bernie's funny. movement, and, and the problem is that Bernie's, Bernie's doing better than that, but he still hasn't done what you would think a democratic socialist would do. A democratic socialist, you would think, would want to turn the factory over to the workers and would want to make a more democratic movement. It should be the antithesis of everything that the Democratic Party National Committee is. It should be open and democratic and controlled by grassroots members. And so far, I'm not seeing that. I think they're wrestling with these issues. I, I'm hopeful that they'll continue to do so. But what we need is to create an alternative to the Washington-based movements I described before. I love what the Working Families Party is doing. They primary some Democrats. They endorse some Democrats. They run some independent candidates. They try to make sure that their strategy serves their issue. I think that's a much smarter approach than the one that the Greens have traditionally taken. I don't mean to insult any of my friends in the Green Party. Final question, Bill Curry. A majority of the people, and it keeps increasing in recent polls, want single payer, full Medicare for all, everybody in, nobody out, free choice of doctor and hospital. It comes in, as you know, much more efficient in terms of cost and it has better outcomes. That's the experience in Canada, our neighbor to the north. Now, the five Democratic representatives to the House of Representatives have refused to sign on H.R. 676, sponsored by Congressman John Conyers from Michigan, which is a single-payer, full Medicare for all bill. 113 Democrats have signed on, but none of the five Democratic representatives from the state of Connecticut, where you live and work, and where you were elected years ago state controller. What do you make of that? Why? Well, I make of it that this is the insurance state still and that people are timid about upsetting that and and are worried about the effect on the short term effect on jobs within their own industry. It's not a, a view I subscribe to. I would also point out though that you know Nancy Pelosi hasn't endorsed it and the House leadership still speaks disparagingly of it. They finally introduced a public option bill. A really strong public option could be the foundation of a single-payer system, which is why I've always felt so strongly about it. When we lost the public option, Obama himself was secretly against it. Our party won't even go that far. And so we have to, in every one of these situations, both here in Connecticut and across the uh, country, we have to be willing to put pressure on the Democrats themselves. We have to be willing to have this debate. Our party... The party leaders are saying, don't have a debate. It's no time to be squabbling. We have to fight this common enemy. 
But in fact, it's our failure to have a debate that got us here. And it's our failure to have a little bit of a civil war that got us here. That's how parties renew themselves. This party is just a patient that lay etherized upon the table. It's dying right before our eyes, even in this hour of our greatest peril. And the reason is that our own progressive group has to bring that insurrection. And for some reason, for the reasons we talked about, hasn't. And because the party itself needs to free itself from its donors and have a real debate, the kind of debate that brings you to European health care system, that brings you to, to an end of systematic public corruption, that takes on new trade policies and, and that deals with climate change, all the issues we care about. Every other country in the developed world is moving ahead of us on all of them. America is turning into a public policy disaster area. Making and, America worse and, again. Yep. Yeah. yeah, and that's what we have to do. The change begins, I think, within the progressive community, and I think it involves the challenge from the progressive community to the reigning Democrats. There you are, listeners. There's the scene in raw reality from Bill Curry. We know what has to be done. The August recess brings these senators and representatives back home. Make sure you fill those seats and those town meetings, and if they don't have town meetings, start your own town meetings. Thank you very much, Bill Curry.